Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. A lot of Americans have been anticipating this day. It's been marked on calendars for quite some time. But remember, it wasn't all that long ago that many people felt helpless against an out-of-control, gigantic government machine, powerless to stop the establishment politicians who controlled the system and, and gave you candidates to pick from. Well, if you've already voted, that's great. If not, what the hell are you waiting for? Polls are closing soon. We have a lot to do. And your vote does count. I'll explain in a second. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Hello, America. Somebody asked me, in fact, Joe, my uh, head researcher, asked me right before. He said, Glenn, why does it matter if your vote, it, why, how, why, how does your vote count? Why go out and vote if it's not going to come down to one person? And for instance, we live in New York. Really? really? Gee, I wonder who's going to win governor tonight. Um, here's why. Because doesn't it uh, send a message when you see the voter turnout in Iraq? When you see 75, 80, 90 percent of the people who have their lives threatened and they will go out and vote, it sends the message to the uh, politicians in Washington, don't you dare take me for granted. I am paying attention, and we are involved. You have to come through us. Through their negative ads, they want to discourage you. But you are anything but discouraged. On my very first day here at Fox News, it was nearly two years ago, it was January 19th, 2009. It was the day before President Obama's inauguration. And I remember thinking after the election, in fact, the day after election, um, that it was great. I did a monologue or two on the radio. People were very upset, um, at least in my audience, that Barack Obama won. And I said, first of all, we've just elected our first African-American president in our history, and it has gone off without a hitch. That is something to celebrate. We've changed as a nation. It ain't the 1960s anymore. Then, I also said at the time, this election is going to wake people up because John McCain is a progressive. Had John McCain won the election, most likely we'd still be asleep. I believe John McCain and Barack Obama were taking us to the same place, except one was walking or maybe on a steam train from time to time. The other is taking us in a spaceship. One of my very early shows here on Fox, I continued to warn, as I did on the other network, of the possible economic trouble ahead. Here's what I said. Today, I want to start with the most urgent threat, and that's the economy. Despite what you might hear from television and talking heads, this crisis, I believe, is far from over. We aren't even close to the beginning of the end yet. It's more like we're nearing the end of the beginning. There were warnings before that. With five days to go before the election in 2008, Obama used language like the fundamental transformation of America. In his first press conference, while still president-elect, um, he talked about the need for stimulus and regulation and green cars. I'll get the green car as soon as I get the flying car. Talking about it was one thing. But once the dominoes began to fall, the reality of what we were really facing began to set in with you, the American people. The stimulus bill that no one read, no one even knew who wrote it. I remember walking into the kitchen one day um, back at my studios, um, and I was talking to the news people, and I said, okay, guys, who wrote this? And they said, I don't know, the congressman. I said, no, 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 somebody else wrote this. This is far too complex. How did they write it? How long did it take to write it? Well, nobody even asked who wrote it except us. It got jammed through. Massive bailouts came. Talk of a giant health care bill started up. Suddenly, stopping this big government onslaught seemed like a monumental and, quite honestly, impossible task. They were overwhelming the system. Many people felt like giving up. It was at that point that, this is about two years ago now, that I took a call on my radio show that opened my eyes. I played it that night on television. Here it is in part. I yeah. really tuned out. Not a magazine, not a paper, nothing. I mean nothing. The only thing I had in the background is you and Rush. It's background music for major headlines. I didn't even know we went, uh, Israel uh, you know, was uh, tossing bombs around with, uh, with the Palestinians. I knew nothing about that until one day I saw a headline when I went to buy some gum. Uh, I really tuned out, I think, a little bit more than you think. I'm one of the zombies that I complained about for 20 years. And I'm, I'm one of them now.
This guy said, I've given up. I made him promise not to give up, to give me a few days. Well, that call inspired the You Are Not Alone special, which we aired. It was a monumental uh, and highly watched special. We, our aim, our goal was to show people that they were not alone. The conservative values were not dead, but we had to stop talking about politics. The 912 project was launched and amazing things started to happen. On September 12th, six months later, thousands gathered in Washington for the biggest rally of its kind, certainly the largest for small government conservatives. Most people had never taken part in anything like this. It began to take on a life of its own. At the same time, the tea parties were springing up all over the country. Even though the media openly mocked with the hilarious jokes about teabaggers, you persisted. You never gave up. You kept coming to your local town and you kept standing in your local squares. Even though the media did their best to mock you, ridicule, or ignore you. Remember Time Magazine, The Year in Pictures, none of these were even mentioned. That is so amazing to me. Even though that happened, you persisted. You weren't discouraged. You never gave up. Even though they threw health care at you, you stood up. You talked to your representatives at your town halls. Some people got beatdowns, but you kept standing up. Some people had their fingers bitten off by union thugs. You stood your ground. They called you every name under the sun. And while that happened, I started telling you about 828. This is the, um, the logo of Restoring Honor, August 28, 2010. I'm going to be on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and we are going to talk about honor, our founders, Washington, Lincoln, and who we really are. There's not going to be one word of politics in it. I invite you to be there to restore honor to this country because that will solve all of it. All the Black Panthers said they were going to show up. Unions went crazy. The media went crazy. Al Sharpton marched, you know, on the other side of the trees. But you came. You were not afraid. You gathered in a way that could not possibly be ignored. Once mocked, once considered an easy target, once called racist, bigots, hate mongers, terrorists. You were an easy target for the establishment just to gobble up and spit out. But you turned the tables. Now the powerful are crawling to you today. The Democrats and the GOP initially said it would be a bad thing to create a third party. You don't want a Tea Party thing. That would be bad. <laughs> really? Really? Was it? They said it would be better to work within the party and go through the primaries. Okay, good point. Let's do it. Let's do it. Because Teddy Roosevelt started a third party. It was called the Bull Moose Party. It was the first progressive party. It failed. He lost. So the progressives went inside both parties. Oh, had they failed? The Tea Party decided to go through the primary process. And in many cases, they won, and won with huge margins. The establishment kicked and screamed, in some cases threatening not to support the candidate who won the primary because it wasn't their hand-picked candidate. You don't know. You guys are too stupid. Look at Joe Miller in Alaska. Lisa Murkowski refused to step down. She's now running as a write-in candidate. In Delaware, GOP did everything they could to defeat Christine O'Donnell, even after she won the primary, beating out GOP favorite Mike Castle. But you stood your ground. Even Charlie Chris in Florida was like, oh, no, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Republican. Really, are you? Well, guess who had to relent? They did. Not you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you actually believe in something. See, that's what they don't understand. You're not going to beat the American people when they are locked into values and principles. You're not going to beat them because they will not sit down. They'll sit down for politics, for political reasons. They'll sit down for a lot of reasons, but not for values and principles. No. The end of the day, in fact, at the end of this day, it is you, you, the individual American that has the real power. Two days ago, or I'm sorry, two years ago, we had forgotten that. We had been so beat down by corruption and, and money and everything else that we felt powerless to do anything about it. We didn't even know how our system worked. 
Most of us didn't even know our history two years ago. Think of where you have come from. Think about what you've known. Think about what you've accomplished. Think of what you've taught yourself. How many books have you read in the last two years? Powerful labor unions, special interest groups, rich billionaires, George Soros. You're standing against George Soros. Powerful career politicians. How do you go up against that and continue to stand? Well, maybe someday somebody will write a book about that because you did. And it all started one voice at a time saying, no, no, I'm not alone. And even if I am, I'll stand and speak because it's the right thing. Today, today is the day that Americans, unlike any other place in the entire world, prove that one voice matters. When Americans come together and unite on common principles, oh, yes, we can change. But what does that change look like? Here it is. New poll shows 75% of Americans feel they are worse off since the last election. That's higher than it has been on the eve of any midterm election since the question was first asked in the mid-1970s. Oh, so it might be significant change tonight. Some are saying this is an election that is a referendum on Obama. Mm, some say it's not. You know the phrase, all politics is local. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is the one time where those two ideas, referendum on Obama and all politics are local, intersect. Let's go through a couple of races here for you. Let's start in Wisconsin. That's the birthplace of progressivism. It is probably the most progressive place in the country. In fact, it's where Joel Rogers... He's the professor, you know, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Joel Rogers, he's the wizard, guy behind the curtain. Big brains behind many of the things pushed by the president and the Tides Foundation. George Soros again. He's the guy who started the new party, the Socialist Party, that decided that they would eat the Democrat, Democratic Party alive if they had to. They would destroy them. Oh, and they have. He also started the Apollo Alliance. That's the group that we found out wrote the stimulus bill. Harry Reid verified that. Apollo Alliance, that's the Tides Foundation, that's George Soros. So now let's see how the progressive ideas are working out in Wisconsin. Well, since the fabulous Joel Rogers stimulus passed, they have lost only 80, uh, 84,700 jobs. That's it. They've had 19,109 properties seized due to foreclosures. But the good news is they rank ninth in the country for tax burden. So they get a lot of taxes, too. Isn't that great? In 2008, Obama won the state 56 to 42. His approval rating there now is 48% approved, 51% disapprove. 56% of progressive Wisconsin wants to repeal the health care law. It is so bad that local politicians passed on appearing with the president at a recent rally at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Notice Joel Rogers isn't anywhere to be seen here either. He's always lurking in the shadows. No politicians here. Even Russ Feingold from the Fein McCain-Feingold bill. Oh, if we could only have gotten rid of both of them this time around. Russ was the one who skipped the rally. You think he would have skipped it in 08? No. Feingold's seat was considered safe earlier this year. But now the progressives have done what they did under Woodrow Wilson. They have spooked the American people. They know what they are. I guess attempts to label an opponent as an ambitious businessman for Russ aren't resonating. I mean, when did ambition become a bad thing? Now let's move to Colorado. Colorado is another deep blue state. It is now. It's a birthplace, however, of something near and dear to Obama's heart, organizing for America. They had the Democratic Convention there, but it wasn't always a blue state. Less than 10 years ago, it was a solid conservative state. So what happened? Well this happen. This is Blueprint. You should read this book. Blueprint, How the Democrats Won Colorado and Why Republicans Everywhere Should Care. It tells in great detail how a group of rich progressives, I wonder if Spooky Dude is involved, over the course of five years were able to literally turn the state on its head by the 2006 election cycle. Just two years ago, everyone in the progressive circle was saying, you got to look to Colorado. We got to do this all across the country. 